I think there's quite a big divide now in uh, conversations about the future of schools because there have been a series of assumptions that we've worked with for a number of years and I think those assumptions are now coming under some pressure. Uh, the assumption that more spending leads to better outcomes, for example, has come under pressure, not only because outcomes in England have not improved at the pace with which the resources have increased and there's been a kind of plateauing of standards, but also that other countries that spend less seem to achieve more. Finland spends less per child than we do, but achieves a great deal more. Now, Finland's a, you know, Finland, if you're teaching in Finland, you start from a much better perspective, much lower levels of poverty, much more kind of homogenous society. But there's no simple correlation between expenditure and outcomes. And also a sense that the intensification of the learning process is not necessarily leading to higher outcomes. A questioning of the relationship between exam performance and underlying uh, standards. Um, and a quest continued questioning of the relevance of what goes on in education in schools to what children are going to have for the rest of their lives. Now, there seem now to be emerging two very dis different answers to that question. In the one corner there is the view, you know, brilliantly articulated by Michael Gove, which is a reassertion of uh, academic rigour. Um, uh, and Michael's views include the idea that there is something problematic about trying to make education relevant to children, that, that the canon is inherently relevant if it's well taught, a suspicion of so-called soft subjects like you know, media studies, and implicitly hostility to the idea that education should be about getting more children to achieve more so that more children get onto the next stage and get into higher education, and the questioning of that. Um, so that's a, tr a focus on traditions, the assertion there's one best way to teach and that that's a traditional way of teaching. Um, and also a suspicion of the idea that schools should be in the business of attending to the wider needs of children, to their emotional needs, to their well-being, to kind of every child matters agenda. On the other hand, there's a very different view uh, which comes out of the kind of the, the running into the sand of the invest and regulate model that we've had for the last uh, decade. And that's a view which I guess the RSA subscribes to much more, which is that uh, we need to think, uh, we need to remove many of the boundaries which we've built around school, the, whether it's the boundary between academic and vocational attainment, uh, whether it's the boundary between schools and communities, whether it's the boundary between the idea of traditional academic learning and the wider development um, of, of children. So in that context, uh, the starting point for what might lazily be called the progressive perspective is an idea of citizenship, the idea of preparing young people to be full citizens, which sees subject knowledge, academic attainment as an important part of that, but only a part of that, but also tends to a wider kind of account of what, what young people need to feel about themselves and about their capacities in relation to the world. And in that context, for example, progressives emphasise relevance and see relevance as a very important thing because it forms a bridge between what goes on in the school and what happens in the other parts of children's lives. So I think that one way of thinking about this is that the traditionalist view sees schools as an oasis, a place where children who may not have structure, may not, have, may not be driven in other parts of their lives, they come to the school and this is a point for them to be inspired by the, the great bits of our history, the great thinkers, the great writers, the great scientists. And the alternative view which says that actually schools should be catalysts for trying to create a wider culture of learning in society and then that's all about connections between schools and communities, connections between the pupil's life in the school and the pupil's life um, outside the school. And I think this debate is really interestingly uh, poised um, at the moment and you know I, I have publicly questioned um, a lot of what Michael Gove says about what he thinks is possible in the curriculum, it's not so much his vision that I oppose, I just don't think it's very practical given the way young people are today. And it will be very interesting to see what happens if the Conservatives win the election between, on the one hand, a very clear view from them about what they think constitutes good teaching and a good school, on the other hand, an argument which says that you should devolve power to parents and to schools, and this is going to be a difficult, difficult balancing act. One of the things I've said to Michael is that he shouldn't underestimate 
that if a Secretary of State for Education who oversees things like Ofsted has a very strong view, that view will permeate the system. And whether through regulation, funding or whatever means, that practice will start to be taken up um, by the system. I think the important thing now is that we should be having this debate. Now, I'm not, I recognise absolutely that there's really high quality traditional practice. I recognise absolutely there are schools that have been turned around from being disasters by good old fashioned kind of mix of discipline and um, you know, uh, um, very ambitious teachers teaching in quite traditional ways. But I also think that overall the direction that is being taken in schools, which is a response to the world that exists and to young people today, is a direction which is focusing more on the child in the round, focusing on the idea of schools as being intelligent communities. Um, it would be very interesting to see what happens in this debate over the next couple of years.